Good afternoon. I'm Mandy Cohen, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for North Carolina, and I'm joined by Director Mike Sprayberry. Um, we have Brian Tipton and Nicole Fox as our American Sign Language interpreters and working behind the scenes as our Spanish language interpreters are Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. Well, thanks for joining this afternoon, and I'll start with a rundown of our numbers. As of this morning, there were 6,764 cases in 93 counties. We have 373 people who are currently hospitalized. And sadly, there have been 179 deaths. To put that last number into context, North Carolina has had 167 flu deaths this past season. And that flu season started all the way back in last September. And remember, for COVID-19, we had our first laboratory-confirmed case on March 3rd, our first death reported on March 24th, and that was less than a month ago. So in less than a month, we've already surpassed flu deaths for this year. COVID-19 is now the leading cause of death in the United States. And it's important to remember that our death rate would have been worse, unfortunately, had we not taken the aggressive action as a state to slow the spread of the virus. We've done hard and important work North Carolinians have been staying home to save lives, to keep our loved ones safe, and to protect our frontline health care workers. Thank you. Thank you for that work. But many are doing that hard work, but also having tremendous hardship to themselves and their families. We understand that sacrifice, and we continue to aggressively pursue every resource we can to help North Carolinians who are struggling because of COVID-19. Since schools closed back on March the 16th, school nutrition and transportation staff have worked tirelessly to ensure children continue to receive meals while out of school. Since then, about 1,000 meal sites have served over 11 million breakfasts, lunch, and dinners across our state. Remarkable. And going forward, the good news is families will now have even more help. Just before today's briefing, Governor Cooper announced that North Carolina is one of four states to be approved for the new Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer Program. This program will help families purchase food for more than 800,000 children who normally receive free and reduced lunch at school. Families will receive $250 per child provided in two installments, paid for with federal funds. Families will not need to apply. Those who are eligible and already receiving food and nutrition service benefits will get the additional benefit on their EBT card automatically. Eligible families not already enrolled in food and nutrition services will receive an EBT card in the mail in the next few weeks. This new program is in addition to other food security efforts. As announced at the end of March, all families that receive food and nutrition services are receiving the maximum amount allowed for their household size for March and April. In March, the department issued $75 million in benefits to 400,000 households that accounted for 850,000 individuals. Parents who need food assistance for their children can text food NC to 877-877 to locate nearby meal sites. And the food texting service is also available in Spanish by texting COMIDA to 877-877. I know that these are challenging and uncertain times for everyone. I want to draw your attention to two additional helplines to connect people to mental health support services. You've heard them from us before, but we hope that they can help you during this crisis. The first is Hope for NC Helpline. It's a mental health resource to support North Carolinians during this whole COVID-19 crisis. Call 1-855-587-3468. For support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
And we have a second line, Hope for Healers helpline, available for our healthcare workers experiencing stress. Call 919-226-2002, and there is help available when you need it. With that, I will turn it over to Director Mike Sperberry for an update. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you for your leadership and expertise. Good afternoon. The State Emergency Operations Center has now been activated for 42 days for the COVID-19 response. We're continuing our mission to source and obtain personal protective equipment Availability of many items is improving and we're receiving and shipping new supplies daily, but some items like gowns and masks remain in short supply. Our medical providers and first responders still do not have all the protective equipment they need and we will continue to work this issue aggressively every day. Our support from the North Carolina National Guard has grown to more than 800 soldiers and airmen on active duty. They're performing missions, including logistics support to include distribution of personal protective equipment and warehousing operations, cyber protection, liaisons to county emergency operations centers, and future operations planning. We thank them a great deal. More than 1,300 medical professionals are now cleared and ready to work as volunteers to support medical surge at our health care facilities. So far, volunteers have gone to work primarily supporting long-term care homes with emergency staffing needs. The Food Supply Chain Work Group continues to meet daily to assess needs and to find ways the state can, provort, can support the private sector food producers and distributors to ensure the food supply chain remains strong. There's an imbalance in the food supply chain right now as the system works to shift from supplying the commercial market to supplying a market that is almost exclusively driven by consumers at home. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, much of our food consumption was at restaurants, schools, universities, workplace cafeterias, and other commercial locations. Now restaurants providing takeout are running about only at, at a fraction of their capacity and most meals are being made and eaten at home. The industry is trying to shift from a packaging in large quantities for commercial customers to smaller quantities for grocery store sales. Available packaging materials is really an issue. We're also closely monitoring the situation at the state's poultry and pork processing plants to make sure that work can continue at those plants. Interruptions to those operations would affect food supply here in North Carolina and beyond our borders. As Secretary Cohen mentioned, the Pandemic Electronic Benefits Transfer Program approval is good news for our state and will help to feed more kids who usually rely on school meals. We continue to encourage to support food banks around the state. They're doing great work to support the growing number of people who need groceries. Visit feedingthecarolinas.org to find a food bank near you. You can make a financial contribution or a donation of shelf-stable foods. We want to give a special thanks to all of you for following the stay-at-home and social distancing guidelines. Your actions are flattening the curve and ensuring this event is manageable for our health care system, our public safety agencies, and other essential functions. Please continue to follow all state and local stay-at-home orders and follow social distancing protocols. In closing, don't forget to look out for your friends and neighbors and call your loved ones daily. I know they'll appreciate it. With your help, we'll get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to Secretary Cohen. Great, thank you so much, Director Sprayberry. And with that, we will turn over to your questions. If you can announce your name and your news outlet when you ask your question, thank you. Media on the line, please press one to raise your hand to get in the queue. Our first question will be from Andrew, Andrea Blanford, ABC 11 WTVD. Uh, hi, Dr. Cohen, it's Andrea Blanford with ABC 11. Um, I, I had a question about the outbreak at News Correctional. 
we got a press release today learning more about that, just the massive undertaking, trying to get that situation under control, including moving hundreds of inmates out of Johnston County. And I was hoping you could give some insight at just about how those decisions were made, why the Department of Prisons felt it was necessary to shut down an entire prison in order to get staff over to Noose. Thank you. Andrea, thanks for that question, and I unfortunately don't have the details on the news correctional facility, but we'd ha be happy to have folks follow up. Um, I will say that our public health team is ve working very closely um, with the folks in um, all of our correctional facilities to make sure that they have the right uh, protocols in place so that they're able to isolate and cohort folks. As we know in the news facility, there there was a lot of folks who they, they found there to have COVID-19. And so I'm not exactly sure on the the, the staffing uh, patterns and situations in terms of, of why decisions will, were made. So I will be sure to have someone from the Department of Public Safety follow up on, on those specifics for you. Our next question is Rick Curl, The Daily Record. Yes, Dr. Cohen, this is Rick Curl with The Daily Record done. Um, and this may be a little, it's a two-part question, and it may be a little out of your knowledge, but where do we stand right now as far as the vac vaccinations are concerned, as far as developing a vaccine, you know, where, wherever it may be? Mm -hmm. And what are the treatments that folks that, are, that have been hospitalized are undergoing you know, obviously there's several different kinds, but uh, can you give a kind of an outline on what the treatment process is? Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for that question. Let me start with vaccines. So vaccines, um, as many have likely been hearing um, in the news, is a very extensive process to go through. Not only do researchers need to obviously iso identify and isolate the virus and and put it into a form that allows it to be in a vaccine. Actually, do they 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 kill the vaccine and make make sure that it can be in in a vaccine form? But then they have to do trials uh, to make sure that that vaccine is safe in in humans, um, and they have to make sure to look for unintended consequences. Sometimes the vaccine itself is fine, but then they want to see your immune response. That's what a vaccine is meant to do. It's meant to stimulate your immune system so that you are able to, to ward off the, the virus should you come exposed to it. And as they develop this vaccine, they want to be watching how does it react in humans and how does their immune system work. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done. I think the we, we have heard in the press in the last week or so that many teams have done the work of isolating the virus. They're already working on testing it in, in humans. So that is that is good. Good news. That means they're in phase one and phase two clinical trials. Uh, but there is still a lot of work to go as they see how this goes with not just a small group of, of uh, people where the vaccine is done, but then they go to larger and larger ones. And they're looking to see how folks respond respond to that and see if there's any side effects, unintended consequences, how their immune system responds. Assuming that all goes perfectly, and there are lots of things that, that may not go perfectly in all of that, then you have to think about, okay, now we have the vaccine, how do we mass produce it for all the folks that need it, not just here in the United States, but around the world? That in and of itself is its own challenge. So I know there are folks thinking about different phases of that vaccine development process. Um, I know there are some researchers here in North Carolina who've been working in the vaccine, particularly I know at, at Duke University and uh, at, at other uh, universities here in North Carolina. I know there's there are tons of smart scientists thinking about it, but it is a very complex and, uh, and not quick process. So we've been saying to not expect a vaccine for at least 12 to 18 months. Um, so that is the time frame in which we are, are looking in terms of vaccine. Let me move on to treatment. So uh, there is not a medicine per se that can treat COVID-19. Most of the treatments that folks would get if they go to seek medical support medical treatment would be what we would call supportive treatment. So if they're having trouble breathing, they're given oxygen, they're given medicines that help open up their lungs, like um, an albuterol inhaler, um, things like that, that may, might help with the symptoms. They'll give them Tylenol for fever, things like that. So those are the kinds of treatments. Obviously, if people get worse and worse. They, they might need to escalate beyond just needing oxygen, but to need to be on a ventilator to help assist in their breathing even further. 
Um, but right now, all of the treatment, meaning medicine options that would actually attack um, the COVID itself and not just the symptom, are really still in the clinical trial phase. We've seen some positive, very small studies for certain types of medication, but we're still at the very early part of knowing is there going to be a treatment for COVID-19 that, that can help. So all of the treatment, treatment, and I use that in quotation that we have right now, is supportive treatment to try to treat the symptoms, not to treat the virus yet. But like I said, clinical trials are going on right now. We learn more every day. These trials at first are very small, and then they need to be replicated in, in larger studies to make sure that we can still see those results. We learn more every day. Um, and again, I know researchers here in North Carolina are partnering with others around the country and around the world to try to learn as much as we can, as fast as we can. Thanks for the question, Rick. Next question is Matt Mercer, North State Journal. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Matt Mercer, North State Journal. On April 6th, the uh, media availability was held um, for the predictive modeling that was being done uh, for several around the state. Have not seen anything else on the Department of Health and Human Services website uh, since that initial call. Has that model been updated? And if so, uh, when will it be available for um, everyone to see? Thanks, Matt, for that question about modeling. That Yes, that was done by an independent group of data scientists from uh, Duke and UNC, RTI, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Novasi, some other organizations came together for that first round of, of modeling. I know they have continued to do their, their work. Obviously, things are changing so rapidly, as are those models. Um, so I think they've been fine-tuning their work. I know that they have have been hoping to put out a next version of the model. I have not seen uh, any uh, new updates of those models yet, but I know that they are working hard to try to get more information out to the public. I would caution us all to rem remember that modeling, uh, as much as we wish it would be precise and would give us a, a roadmap to exactly what we can expect, models are not the crystal ball that we would hope it would be. There are a number of models that have been circulating uh, uh, from some various researchers, and all of them have, have been changing. Because as we learn more, the model is able to get better at understanding how the virus works, how our efforts to stay home might slow the spread of the virus, and how they build that into the model. Um, so these things are changing so often that it is hard to actually pin down um, how things would, would, would move forward uh, in, in COVID-19. So I know the data scientists are working very hard on that, um, and we can put you uh, in, in touch with those, with those data scientists who are continuing to work. But um, we continue to be able to share data on our dashboard about cases um, that we're seeing right now, um, but not doing the modeling directly ourselves. Thanks for that question. Next question, Elizabeth Ann Brown, Asheville Citizen Times. Hi, this is Elizabeth Ann Brown from the Asheville Citizen Times newspaper. Um, especially as um, so much of our modeling relies on the accuracy of our data and the completeness of the data set that's available uh, to the state, are on the state level, are y'all encouraging posthumous testing? Um, I know that the circumstances under which each county encourages testing vary, uh, but I'd love to know your guidance on that. Elizabeth, thanks for that uh, question, and you're absolutely right that, that modeling is only as good as the data that you can feed into it, and we know that all of our data has limitations. We know, for example, that our case counts that we see of COVID-19 are only the lab-confirmed case counts um, that we're seeing, and we know that there's other COVID-19 cases out there we're not capturing um, in, in our testing numbers, and so that makes it hard to, to use that to, to predict what's going forward. For your, for your question about posthumous um, testing and how that's going forward, you know, most of that that time it is really fam family dependent decisions whether they want to be testing their loved one um, for COVID-19 uh, afterwards. I will go back and check with, with our uh, medical examiner team to see if we've given out some standardized gu guidance. I do know if a death was, was um, 
uh, uncertain and the medical examiner needs to get involved. I know they, they will do testing as they see necessary, um, but I am not sure if a family wanted to request how that process works. So let us get back to you um, on, on those additional details. But again, more data is helpful, but we do also want to um, respect that, that families make different decisions uh, after someone may have passed. Next question, Laura Leslie, WRAL. Hi, Secretary Cohen. Can you hear me okay? I can. Hi, Hi Laura. Hey there. Um, okay, two questions uh, just quickly. One is, it looks like we're still only testing about 2,500 cases a day, and I know we've gotten through our backlog. Do you feel like that's enough? And if it's not, what's, the part, what's stopping us from testing a lot more? And then the second question is, as you know, a lot of folks are increasing cries to reopen the state. We're seeing South Carolina looking at rolling back some business restrictions, Texas rolling them back as well. Why is North Carolina not in a position to follow suit, or are we? Well, thanks for that. So, yes, on testing, um, as we've been talking about for about a week now, testing and increasing our testing capacity is going to be important as we respond to COVID-19, and particularly to your second part of your question, as we think about a reopening strategy, um, increasing our testing capacity is something that's really important. There are, I, I, I want to make sure we know that there are two parts to the testing, the sample collection as well as running those samples at the lab, and we need to increase both. So we are, we are trying to work with our private lab partners to increase their throughput per, per day, so the number of samples that they could run every single day. And I'll say, we have, we have come a long way, and North Carolina is in a very good position there, but I want to see it get even better. I think we also want to diversify the kinds of tests that we are doing so that we don't and no one lab res relies on on a supply chain that may have of uh, trouble. So we want our state to be diversifying as well as using different types of testing modalities, the ones where you have to send it off and it takes 24 to 36 hours. We want to also start to incorporate the rapid testing um, as well, um, though I will say the rapid testing has even more supply chain issues than we're, we're doing better on the higher throughput lab test um, and is still the rapid test that has issues. But then the sample collection side is also um, the issue that we have to think about having enough swabs, but also the personal protective equipment that is needed to take those samples. I think there are new modalities that are, are just coming online. We, we were starting to hear about it over the weekend and today. Our lab team is exploring this more with our lab testing partners about new ways to collect samples that won't take as much personal protective equipment. As we've been talking about for many weeks, personal protective equipment has been a real challenge um, on a lot of fronts. And so we, wanna pr we want to be able to collect as many samples as we can, but not use up all of our masks and our gowns and our gloves. So as we get these new modalities for testing, that's going to be really important. So there isn't a, there isn't a, isn't a precise number is that we want to go from this number of test throughput to that number because it's a component of the sample collection in addition to the lab throughput number. But you are right in saying we're not at enough today. I want to see us go get, get even further uh, as we go. It's exactly what our testing surge work group is, is working on um, right now. We particularly want to be targeting our communities of color. We want to make sure that every community um, has, has access to testing. So what our focus for this week is to make sure that we are standing up additional community sites that focused on our communities of color. So that's really our, uh, our focus in particular this week. And on the reopening guidance, yes, we have said that you know, we all want to uh, start to think about reopening, but it's going to take a few components for us to get there. First is the testing, as we've been talking about. The other is our capacity for tracing, as, so the detective work once people get COVID-19 to understand their contacts. But importantly, we have to look at the data, look at our trends, right, the last T of that. Um, and so we have been looking at data points like our case counts, our death rates, our hospitalization rates, our percent of positive tests to negative tests, all of those things are going to be important. Our surveillance, our, our syndromic surveillance data, all of this is up on our website right now. We're trying to do different ways of looking at those trends, looking at it at the county level, the regional level, the state level. 
Um, and so as we look at those trends, that is what's going to guide our decision about reopening. And I think we, we've said many times, it will remind us, that this virus is here with us, to go back to the earlier question, until there's a vaccine. And so the question is, how do we reopen in uh, a smart and phased way to make sure that we're pr protecting folks as we go forward here? So that's the work that's, that's underway right now. Thanks for the question, Laura. The next question is Claire Donnelly, WFAE. Hi, it's Claire Donnelly from WFAE Radio. Um, Secretary Cohen, do you have a time frame for when those three T's that you were just talking about would be at a level that, that you would be satisfied with for reopening? Claire, thanks for the question. So I, I think that we're, it's too early to tell. Um, you know, what I think that North Carolina has been very successful at slowing the spread of the virus. Um, we, we, have been, we have seen that staying at home and that early aggressive work has kept us from having a spike in cases or a surge on our medical system, and that's been fantastic. I think that we have done the work that we needed to do. I feel really good about that work. And so the question is, how do we think about the, the appropriate time for reopening? I think that those are the things we want to think about in the, in the coming weeks. I think that is a weeks and not a month. But again, it's too early to tell, and we're going to continue to have to look at the trends that we see uh, in, in our data. Um, and we want to make sure that we are not accelerating uh, cases and accelerating upwards our hospitalization. We want to make sure that we are, we are trending downward. And that is the, the guidance that the White House put out last week as well, right? They said downward trajectory of cases, downward trajectory of syndromic surveillance. Um, and so all of those things are, are what we're going to be, be looking at. Um, I, I know folks want to get back to um, other parts of their lives. I do too. And so we're going to work as hard as we can. But I will say the, the better we can do right now here in April at staying at home, uh, doing all of the important things when we have to go out to do the social distancing, uh, when, when you're out in public, even in the grocery store, to make sure you're washing your hands, all of those things matter um, as, as we go forward here and will help us understand where we are um, as a state and how soon we can get to the, the first phases of reopening. Next question is Dan Kane, News and Observer. Thank you for taking my question. It's Dan Kane with the News and Observer. Um, uh, and I'd like to have an opportunity for a follow-up question. Uh, I wanted to ask um, about the uh, what it, what the plan is for doing um, uh, wider testing of prisons in uh, North Carolina. There are about I think there are more than 20 prisons that, have, from what I see on the website, have have no tests done at all. A number of others that have only like uh, a handful of tests. And when I asked about this yesterday, a uh, spokesman said that there is a, some kind of process in place to try to go, de to, to go there, and I'd like to like have more details and, and more, more of a timeline as to when that's supposed to happen. Thank you. Dan, can I clarify? Did you say testing in prisons? Is that what you said? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes. State prisons. State prisons. Sorry. I, I just want to make sure I was clarifying. So generally, uh, um, testing starts when someone has symptoms, right, um, as, as, you, as you might expect. So. Um, when someone presents with fever or cough and there is, a, um, there is suspicion for COVID-19, I think that is when testing would be initiated. And then if you see a positive case come back in that, that situation, you would want to find out who would that person be in close contact with, test their contacts. If those contacts are positive, then you test others. It's sort of a, the same way that we would follow procedures for any person who was who was having symptoms, found positive, and 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 go forward from there. So I, I'm not surprised to hear if a place didn't have testing. It may be that no one was presenting with any symptoms of fever or cough of or anything of clinical concern. Um, but I I am also not in those settings. But that that would be my first uh, thought on how testing is approached there. But we'd be happy to have someone from. Um, the Department of Public Instruction and the, and the correctional facilities follow back up with you on the details there. But I, again, I think it would be symptom-based, symptom certainly, uh, at the beginning. Okay, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure, go ahead, Dan. 
Um, uh, so you're saying basically that uh, 20 jails with probably hundreds of inmates, no one has shown any COVID-like symptoms. And then to add to that, I am not aware of a case to emerge from a, a county jail, which we have roughly 100. And, and if there are any, I'd, I'd appreciate that information. Uh, I'm just curious as to whether or not, given these are, you know, tightly, you know, confined facilities, people are close together, it's hard to have social distancing, you know, whether or not, um, um, you know, not going in and doing sample testing, so to speak, is a good idea. Right. Thanks, Dan, for the question. So, yes, the way we are doing all of our testing protocols, even in congregate settings like a jail or a prison, um, is that they're they are symptom-based, and then they are contact-based. So it starts with symptoms um, and then from, from moves from there. Um, I think you're definitely right in pointing out that these are settings where viral spread is more likely. It is certainly uh, settings that we are tracking um, and that we are offering help from the state public health perspective as well as the local local um, public health perspective, if any of those um, folks need help with um, identifying cases and, and setting up a, t a testing plan. Um, but again, it does start with uh, symptom recognition and folks who have fever and, and cough. Our last question will be Holden Kerwicki, WNCN. Yes, this is directed at Secretary Cohen, and I just wanted to kind of double back around on some of these prison questions that we've had. What has been done to make sure that you're maintaining social distance between the offenders and the staff, or is that even possible? And are you trying to quarantine the people who have been in close contact? Thanks for the question about prisons. I'm, I apologize that we didn't have our correctional facility folks with, with me today, given the, the focus of uh, today's questions. Um, but we'll make sure to be following up on this. But what, what I would say is that any of these congregate settings, we have given guidance about how to do the appropriate infection control. It does require identifying of positive cases, cohorting them, which means putting them, them together in, in, a, in a, a way that is, is away from those that are, are negative with COVID-19. It is obviously symptom monitoring to make sure folks aren't escalating to have worse symptoms of shortness of breath or need additional treatment. Obviously, there's deep cleaning involved, hand washing, and, and, and those sorts of uh, activities. I know folks are using face coverings as well. So all of those things are written in our uh, and detailed in our, our protocol, but we'll also make sure, since there's so many questions here, uh, to see if we can set up a phone briefing with our folks at the correctional facilities so that you can get even, even deeper into, into the details here. So I think that was our last question. I just want to thank everyone again for tuning in. Uh, thanks to our, our teams who have been working incredibly, incredibly hard to respond to not only outbreaks uh, in long-term care facilities or correctional facilities, um, but to prepare um, all of the data that you see every day that is not an easy task to do all the work on our food security uh, announcements that we made today. That was a ton of work and I think a lot of great help um, for North Carolinians going forward. So uh, thank you. Stay well, stay home, save lives. Thank you.